Okay, thank you very much. So good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you are. My name is Frank Fukuyama. I am a senior fellow uh, at the Freeman Spogli Institute and part of the Center on Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law. And I wanna welcome you to this special session of CDDRL, uh, uh, CDDRL seminar series. I'm really delighted to be able to welcome Sir Michael Barber uh, to speak to us uh, today. Uh, this was originally scheduled for last November, but due to various uh, uh, scheduling problems, we had to delay it. But I'm extremely happy that uh, we're able to uh, do this now. Uh, he's going to be speaking about uh, a new book called Accomplishment, How to Achieve Ambitious and Challenging Things. Uh, Sir Michael has a very distinguished career uh, who, which is focused really on how you actually get things done in the real world. This is a subject that is dear to my heart because academics are frequently not the best people in actually making real change happen. Uh, he was part of the delivery unit in the prime minister's office uh, under uh, uh, Tony Blair. He set up uh, uh, an organization called the Delivery Institute. Uh, we at CDDRL have something called the Leadership Academy for Development, and we've been uh, very profitably working with the Delivery Institute because we're concerned with uh, very similar types of things. Uh, in uh, his later role, Sir Michael has helped uh, a lot of countries to actually uh, produce results, deliver services, improve the quality of education, uh, and uh, has been extremely effective in applying the lessons uh, taken from his experience in the UK government and uh, uh, using them in uh, circumstances, uh, you know, difficult circumstances like, uh, let's say, Pakistan, uh, to improve the quality of government uh, there. Uh, so with that introduction, uh, Sir Michael, why don't you uh, take it away and uh, talk to us about uh, your most recent writing. Thank you very much, Frank. Thanks very much for the introduction. Thanks for the opportunity to be with you all, uh, wherever you are in the world. It's always an honor to work with Stanford um, it's particularly an honor to work with Francis Fukuyama, whose work I've been reading for since I can remember, uh, and is one of the most influential people in the way I think about the world and uh, democracy development and the rule of law are fundamental issues facing uh, actually the whole world at the moment. Uh, and so I think that that work is really important and it's great to be uh, part of this. And one aspect of generating support and enthusiasm and belief in the rule of law and democracy is for democratically elected governments to say what they're going to do, get elected and then do it and deliver it. So delivery is actually, it's, it's not the only thing that matters and governments that aren't democratic can deliver too, but it's very important that democratic governments are set up to deliver. And what the, the, the new book accomplishment is about achieving ambitious and challenging things. The basic assumption is if they're not ambitious and challenging, anybody can do easy things. So I don't need to talk about that. But ambitious and challenging things have a number of characteristics, which I'll come to in a minute. The most important of which is if it's ambitious and challenging, then by definition, you don't know at the beginning all you need to know to deliver it. And therefore you have to design a system to learn as you implement. So it's not that you get it all set up and then implement, it's you get started and you learn and you refine and you uh, make progress. So I'm going to talk about that. But what the book does builds on my experience in government all, all around the world, as, as Frank was just saying, but it also brings examples from other walks of life. Because what I discovered uh, over time was that what I'd found worked in governments, that the characteristics of accomplishment in government were replicated very closely in elite sport, in business, in art, in science, and indeed in your own personal goals. So I applied them to myself to cycle the length of the United Kingdom or to ride my bike very fast in a time trial. So I, I, the, what I thought was 
I try and do in the book, and I, I, I hope I've done uh, successfully, is to identify the pattern of accomplishment that applies to any ambitious and challenging thing that you take on. Um, and if, if, if it's true, if, if the pattern is right, and if it could be applied in all kinds of circumstances, then it's very good for people who want to come out of the pandemic and fulfill some aspiration they've always had. It's very good for organizations who now need to redesign themselves to think about how they're going to uh, be effective in the new normal. And it's very good for governments who have struggled, uh, as we've all seen in the last few years, not just with the pandemic, but with other characteristics of the 21st century that we're all dealing with. And then finally, if this pattern works in every event, then there are some huge challenges facing humanity that we need to deal with. Climate change will be one. We had all the countries in the world pretty much arrived in Glasgow for COP26 in November, including uh, your president, uh, which was very welcome. Nearly every country in the world now has a climate change goal when they want to get to net zero by 2050 or roughly there, a few are a bit later and some are a bit sooner. But very few, uh, and, and by the way, the developed world uh, with, with contributions from your government and the British government and uh, many others has raised something like a hundred billion dollars a year to spend on that. That's a lot of money. It's not enough to do all that needs to be done, but it's a lot of money. But I haven't seen any serious thinking about how to connect the goals that countries have set to a pattern of accomplishing those goals and to investing the money to enable them to accomplish those goals. There's no uh, thought or very little thought, hardly any media commentary. And even when I talk to government leaders about it, as I have done in the last uh, few months, very few people know how they're going to go about achieving their climate change goals or what money they'll need, or if they get money, what they'll do with it. And the people who are going to spend the money don't have any real accountability for how that money will be spent. So accomplishment matters for individuals coming out of pandemic. It matters for organizations coming out of the pandemic. It matters for countries and governments and, and in, in the US at city level and state level, as well as, uh, as, as, well as federal level. And it matters uh, globally for taking on some of the challenges that we now have, which are probably the biggest challenges humanity has ever created for itself. So the question is, what is the pattern? And I start with, I'm going to go through six or seven characteristics. First of all, ambition. Obviously, if you're going to achieve ambitious things, you've got to have some ambition. The classic in American history is Kennedy saying in 1961, very early on in his presidency, that he was going to put a man on the moon by the end of the 1960s. Actually, if you go through the script of that, you find that he made the speech, but when he when he said it, there was a kind of muttering in Congress. They didn't all say, oh, that's a wonderful thing. They were wondering if it was a good idea. And he, very unusually for Kennedy, ad-libbed the next sentence or two of his speech, very, very unusually in Congress anyway, for him to ad-lib. And he basically said, if you, well, if, if, we're, not, if we're not gonna do it, we're not gonna do it, but if we do wanna do it, we, should, we need to decide soon because otherwise it's gonna, so it was a kind of, take it or leave it, but a little bit hesitant. Anyway, so he, he did put the money in and he did uh, set the goal and he did move on. But actually, until the mid 60s, it wasn't really clear. He hadn't said in Congress, we're gonna put the first man on the moon. He'd said, we're gonna put a man on the moon. When, Kennedy, when, when uh, Johnson was president in 1965, he went to NASA and um, to, to make a speech and he, it was, it was meant to be quite a minor speech. And there was a junior speechwriter in the White House called Bob Hardesty. And, Ken, uh, and Johnson got the Hardesty speech the evening before he was going to NASA and he didn't like it. He sent it back to Hardesty with a note saying, there's no headlines in this. Hardesty hadn't even known he was meant to be writing a speech with headlines in. So anyway, the next morning, he does a bit more research. He calls a couple of people at NASA and he writes in the killer sentence, America will put the first man on the moon. Only weeks before the Soviet Union had put an unmanned spacecraft on the moon. So this was absolutely, so with it, with it so, so he then submitted it to the president's office. The president's office, as it happened, the chief of staff and various others were out and it was only a couple of hours before. So nobody vetted the speech before it went to Johnson and Johnson read this and he absolutely loved it. And he delivered the speech and the story was around the world within uh, a very short space of time. Hardesty then got a whole series of phone calls uh, 
making him fear for his job. He thought he was going to get fired. But actually, he ran into Johnson by coincidence in the White House that early evening. And Johnson, being a very physical kind of guy, threw his arms around Hardesty and says, now that's what I call a headline. Uh, and the reason I'm telling you that story at length is sometimes ambition doesn't, if you're very rational, like the NASA people didn't want to set a goal like that. They were, they were furious with Hardesty. You need a bit of irrationality to get a very ambitious goal. And putting the word first in made it a lot more ambitious, given where the Russians were. But then Johnson knew he had to deliver it and people got behind it and they got the job done. So sometimes ambition, you take the evidence into account, but if you just rely on the evidence you've already got, you probably won't set as ambitious a goal as you might have done, because by definition, ambition is going beyond what you already know. Second bit of the pattern is intelligence or mapping or working out what, what, what are the challenges? What would it take? The, the, uh, the, 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 this team that keeps winning the Tour de France or did in, uh, in the last few years, Team Sky, they, whenever they get the, the map of this year's Tour de France, which comes out uh, in about February for, for, for July, they do what they call a very serious piece of work called understanding the demands of the event. Exactly what does each stage look like? They send people out to reconnoitre it, to measure the slopes, to look at the wind direction, to understand. Sometimes they've ridden stages before. They do a very detailed, do we understand in depth, in detail, the demands of the event? Uh, in the way that sometimes, but rarely in government, uh, people think that through. In military and intelligence services, they sometimes do that really well, but often not. The story I tell in the book is of the England football soccer manager, uh, Gareth Southgate, who took the England team to the World Cup in Russia. They, England had never won a penalty shootout in a World Cup in all the years before. They'd always lost, as everybody in England knows and remembers. Anyway, so they got into a penalty shootout in the round of 16 against Colombia. They had thought about this in advance. Every single player had practiced two penalties they'd do if they got chosen on the evening. So the squad was 23 people, all of them had two penalties. Um, and they were told that if they were picked, they should do that penalty, one of those two penalties. They shouldn't change their mind as they walked up to take it. They should just get it right. But the goalkeepers, the, the three goalkeepers in the squad, you don't know who's going to be in goal that evening. They watched every single televised penalty by a member of the Colombian squad in preparation because they knew they were playing Columbia. They didn't know they would be in a penalty shootout, but they knew they might be. And they decided as a group, the three of them with the coach, which way they'd dive if X or Y or Z walked up to take a penalty on the Colombian team. So they decided that all in advance. That is really good use of intelligence. The only problem the goalkeeper on the evening was worried about was how will I remember which who this is and which way I'm meant to dive. And so they wrote, all of the Colombian squad names on his water bottle. And between each penalty, he went and looked at his water bottle, saw the name, uh, and then eventually dived the right way and England won a penalty shootout. That's what intelligence and mapping looks like at detail in sport, but also uh, in, in government and organizations. So really understanding the demands of the event. Third characteristic is planning. The, 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 the famous quote on planning, again, comes from American President Eisenhower, uh, don't have much faith in plan, uh, plans, they never survive contact with the enemy, but the planning is essential. Uh, I live about 10 miles from a pub, an ancient English pub, which is where Eisenhower stayed when he was practicing for the Normandy landings on the beaches about 10 miles away from me over that way. Um, and he stayed here and, and uh, American and British troops practiced the Normandy landings on the Devon beaches and Eisenhower stayed in that pub. And the reason he went into such detail was a very meticulous planner, was he, although he knows the plan isn't gonna work, he knows the planning is essential. Uh, and this is very important. So you do the planning in detail. You don't plan so much that you don't get started. You, 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 those of you who studied American Civil War remember General McClellan endlessly preparing the troops and frustrating Lincoln because he would never be prepared to de deploy them because having done the planning so meticulously, he didn't want them to get shot down in battle. And so he, he ends up um, with, with Ulysses S. Grant, Lincoln does, uh, who does fight. And when they want to, to fire him because he drinks too much and he's a bit of a pain in the neck, 
Lincoln says, I can't spare that man, he fights. So the planning mustn't stop action, but it is uh, really essential. And part of that planning is building the team around you that understands the plan, understands what might go wrong with the plan, but will stick with the mission even when the plan uh, turns out to not work in practice. Fourth characteristic, data and monitoring, you have to check that things are working. You have to know if you're the leader, you have to know whether your plan is working or not working at any given moment. It's not good enough to wait for some review or evaluation or academic study, or important though those may be for future things. You have to know as close to real time as you can. When I was doing the work in Pakistan that Frank mentioned a few minutes ago, we wanted to make sure, this is before the pandemic, vaccinating every young child against the childhood basic diseases which hadn't been happening very well in Punjab, but had happened well in Punjab, India, just across the border, which infuriated the chief minister of Pakistan, of Punjab, Pakistan, who didn't want to be outdone by his Indian neighbors. Um, so we, we want to know, are the what's the problem? Vaccinators, uh, there's plenty of them. The vaccine, there's plenty of it. The problem is they're just not doing their job. They're not working half the days when they should be. So we give them all a tablet. Now we can track them on GPS. And when they vaccinate a child, they're required to photograph the child and the photograph will go straight into a computer in Lahore. And so in real time, we're now seeing the vaccinations happen and we're seeing where the gaps on the map are. And then we send the vaccinators where the gaps on the map are. So we're using geotagging, real time data uh, and mapping to get in instant feedback almost on what's working. And it turned out to be the fastest ever rollout of up to herd immunity of, of, of childhood um, childhood vaccinations. So that's the data and monitoring. And, and there's some great examples in the US of this. Some universities have done really well on this, some graduation rates. If you look at what Martin O'Malley and others did with Chesapeake Bay, we wish you can still check online, you'll see the way they monitored the water quality and changed it over time. That was using seven jurisdictions, not just Maryland, but all the, all the ones on the, on, on, on the shores of the bay. So this, this can be done and that uh, it's got easier and uh, cheaper to do really good data. And then you need the monitoring, you need the people who make the decisions to be looking at the data and deciding what to do. So you need to build routines in to check that the data is being used. Uh, and that's the, when, when I left Blair said, the best thing you did was build routines in the way I worked. I, I don't have to work, I, I don't have to think about my domestic policy that often because you're doing it. But routinely, I get a weekly note, I get a monthly stock take, and I get a six monthly update on the key priorities. So I know what's happening at any given moment. I reckoned after I'd left, he spent somewhere between 50 and 100 hours a year on his, on, on his domestic policy priorities, two hours a week. That is a really good bargain for a political leader because he's, he's got to deal with the Iraq war, he's got to deal with Afghanistan, he's got to deal with George Bush, he's got endless EU summits to go to. He's doing all that. But if he knows that in two hours a week, he can keep on top of his domestic policies, that's a fantastic deal. Um, and uh, I've done the same with Justin Trudeau and, and others. Uh, I worked with the uh, Commissioner for Education in Louisiana, who on two hours a week was able to drive up graduation rates really dramatically uh, there. So these are things that can be done. And then the rest of it gets a little bit harder. You just have to stick at it. Um, this is there's no there's no technique. Um, I did work in the first half of last year for Boris Johnson. He said, "Can you set up for me what you did for Tony Blair?" And so we set that up, and we've, it's a beautiful thing. And he's got good staff, and he's got a good leader of it. But I said to him when I left in a letter, "You have to. It'll all work, but it depends on your discipline and vigilance. And the political leader does have to persist with it. Um, and that's true. But if you think of your own." Uh, plans. If you're going to cycle the length of Britain, you have to persist with it. You have to not get put off the first time you crash or, 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 or get a puncture. So focus and persistence is really important. One American president who was actually very good, he's not a celebrated president at all, but he, in terms of his objective, was, was Calvin Coolidge. He set out to cut American expenditure dramatically during the Roaring Twenties. I personally wouldn't be in favour of that policy but he was absolutely persistent with it, even after the 1928 election, after, um, you know, so he was, he was in the last few months of his term, he was still meeting weekly on Fridays with his um, 
the, the, the head of his uh, finance department, uh, sorry, his budget administrator, to check what more cuts they could make in government expenditure. Now, I, I personally don't agree with this girl, but the, the meticulousness with which she pursued it. If you were an American civil servant in the federal government at that time, you got given a pencil to do your work and you couldn't get a new one until you showed to the uh, supplies a stub less than half an inch long and then they give you a new one. Um, so that's, that's focus and persistence. Uh, I had a similar task in Pakistan after the flood, they had a terrible flood there and I happened to be arriving for, for one of my 54 visits just after the flood. And they said they were shell-shocked. It had been terrible. The size of England had been underwater. And I was very sympathetic, actually. But they said, well, we've had a flood. We can't do education reform anymore. And I could have, part of me just wanted to say, I really understand. But what I actually said was, did the flood make your schools better? You had a big problem with your schools before the flood. Did it make them better? And obviously the answer to that is no, it made them worse in some ways because it had washed away quite a few schools. So once you face that question, this is what about persistence. You have to get back onto the task and say, yes, our problem, we had a problem before, we've had a flood, we've still got a problem, it's a bit bigger and we're going to deal with it. And it will be the same for lots of people as we come out of the pandemic, both in families, in businesses, in universities, in countries. You've got to get back and remember the priorities that were important to you before and get on and do them. And then there's a whole set of problem solving techniques. And the final thing I'll say is, and this is about success, there's quite a lot of evidence when you start looking at the stories, and, and I tell several stories in the book, of, that when you finally succeed, the sense, the personal sense, there might be an initial sense of achievement or celebration, but then there's a kind of a, a period, a dip, um, I quote Boris Becker, the great German tennis player who completely messed up his life after early success at being an absolutely brilliant tennis player. I quote Meriwether Lewis, the person Jefferson sent to, you know, on the Lewis and Clark expedition to, to map the East and find uh, ways of getting across and water routes and where would the Missouri end and all that. But he came back Jefferson loved the fact that he'd done this wonderful trip, loved his notebooks. They lay on the floor of the White House with Meriwether Lewis's map laid out in front of them. They had a fantastic time. He made it, he put him in charge of the Louisiana Purchase, which he just got from Napoleon. And Lewis went off to St. Louis and was there. And Jefferson kept writing to him. And then and Jefferson's successor saying, How's the book coming on about the, the Great Expedition? And Lewis said, Oh, it's doing all right, it's doing all right. But it never actually appeared. And then one night, they, he decides to go back to see Monroe Lewis and then he checks in to the Grinders Inn in Tennessee and commits suicide. He couldn't cope with the enormity of what he'd achieved and the expectations of it. Now, fortunately, it's not like that for everybody, but there is a sense of disappointment. And so I like the, the question I like, I don't know, you've probably all seen the, um, the great show Hamilton that's started in New York and has been running in London really well. And there's a song in that called What Comes Next. And I think one of the things when you accomplish things is what comes next. And for governments, it's really important because the job's never done because the world changes all the time. You get new threats, you get new problems, you get new uh, issues arise all the time. And so while you achieve one thing, you will find the agenda's moved on and you can't just say, well, we've done that now and sit back on your laurels. You've got to get on and do the next thing. So... Accomplishment is possible for everybody. That's the argument I'm making, whatever level you're at, whether it's you, you as an individual, you as a family, you as a community, whatever, uh, up to meeting climate change. There is a pattern to it. We can all make it work. It requires discipline and vigilance. But if we did all improve our capacity at every level to accomplish ambitious and challenging things, I think we'd have a really good chance of making the world a better place. Uh, thank you uh, very much. That was a terrific introduction, both to the method and to your, uh, to your book. Uh, so we want to have a broader discussion. If you do have uh, questions for Michael Barber, please use the Q&A function and write the question uh, in that box. Uh, to start off the discussion, uh, so first of all, let me say that um, 
we have been running both our Leadership Academy for Development and we've been teaching a master's in international policy uh, program here at Stanford. And, you know, we try to teach, uh, in a way, deliverology. Uh, we, we have slightly different, a slightly different framework, but there are many, many similarities, you know, in terms of setting goals and thinking through uh, the planning of implementation and so forth. One of the big uh, issues that uh, our students struggle with, and I think people in the real world struggle with, is the first point that you were making about ambition, which is really about scaling, you know, the objective that you are seeking. Yeah. And um, so it's a nice story about Johnson getting the first man on the moon. But, you know, I imagine that you could find plenty of other cases where people just got too ambitious and they tried to solve unsolvable. I mean, if you said, okay, our goal is to get rid of corruption in Pakistan, it's just not yeah. gonna happen, right? It's just not gonna happen. Um, and so I wonder if you could say a little bit more about how people ought to think about the appropriate scale. For example, one strategy is actually to start with prototypes and you know, experiment and then if they work, then you yeah. can think about, you know, the much more ambitious follow on projects. Is that what you did in in or is that how you advise, you know, your uh, people to to operate or how do you think about that set of issues? Well, I, I, I mean, the uh, what's appropriate will depend on the circumstances and in, in something on the political leader and the sort of moment in time. So I do, I do. I think those are all very, very important issues. And you're right that that testing things out um, is really important. Possible possibility so one thing like, like we did this with a very successful what became a very successful national literacy strategy for for primary elementary schools across england very successful the first part of that though is piloting it in 150 schools and testing it out and refining it. not 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 piloting to see whether to do it but piloting it to see whether you could get the detail right and make it work so i do think that that is a good that is a good um option um so in many circumstances and then you what you want as a leader when you're setting ambition you're right you can set kind of ludicrous things that are that are impossible uh and or, or just uh you, you're not set up but you, so you need a team around you of people who will test out your thinking um what Bla blair's who was very good at this he would say why don't we do this uh i can remember him saying to the national crime agency what would it actually take to eliminate serious and organized crime completely? And they said, well, they just said, well, we haven't got the money. We haven't got, he said, I know no, but, but take all the constraints away. If you had the task of eliminating, what would you actually do? And they'd say, oh, we haven't got enough people. They, they couldn't imagine that. So you need to encourage people into the thought experiment. If we were going to do this ludicrously ambitious thing, how would we do it? And then you come back to the real world. The too often in governments they rule out the ambition at the beginning because they have all the constraints of the current time. So one thing is to is to try and get a dialogue around the the minister or the leader where you say, well, just for a minute, forget about those constraints. How would you do that if you had to, or if you really wanted to? And then you come back and say, okay, so we have got a real world, we have got a limited budget, we have got these constraints, the unions won't like it, etc. Now, how much of that can we manage? At least you've considered the ambition rather than ruling out from the beginning. So I think that's that I've had that conversation with many governments all over the world, and and I think that get getting them to just leave aside the constraints for a thought experiment and then come back to the real world it is a real a real test of this. And then the other thing is, what are the circumstances? If you're if you're Churchill in 1940, you you know you 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 set the ambition that you'll fight them on the beaches and you'll never surrender because your alternatives are much worse. So you do have to take those into account. Right. Um, so another question is really about the politics of bringing about uh, the kinds of uh, changes uh, in uh, delivery, policy delivery. To what extent does it depend on your working for a political leader that really wants to do the right thing. Uh, because you can certainly imagine situations in which the biggest constraint is actually the government itself. Uh, 
And in fact, I believe that the chief minister in Sin that you were working for has, you know, himself gotten in trouble, you know, with accusations of things like corruption and so forth. But if you think that there are, you know, real problems in the political environment, how political do you get in, in terms of, you know, your operations? Yeah, it's a very good question, and there's no simple answer to it. The, I mean, we one of the things that um, I find in development aid generally, and technical and the World Bank and the British um, Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office and so on, is that people conceptually try to separate development assistance from politics, and quite often they then move to a an even bigger mistake, which is to think that politics is the problem. And so, so then it becomes two separate things. And if only those terrible politicians would go, well, we could get on and do this. Um, but as, as you've argued in, in uh, many books, in the end, you know, we, we have politics because there are complicated um, decisions to be made about how you gather resources, how you spend them, about what direction you want to take something in. And politics is the way we try to solve those things. We can't do without politics. So we, what we, what we do is, I always say there are three things you have to think about to any of our teams working anywhere in the world. One is the actual personality character of the political leader. You do need to do that. And if if there's no leadership, if there's no ambition, or, or the, if there's corruption, and like you, you mentioned, Sindh, I worked in Punjab, but I did. I was asked to work in Sindh, and I refused because. The then, not now, but the then political leader of Sin was blatantly corrupt, and I knew I I just didn't think I could possibly work with him to get important things done. Whereas the then chief minister of Punjab, who has got involved in accusations of corruption later, as you were saying, he actually had real determination. So the character of the political leader is important. The nature of the constitution is important. So that if you look at the the struggles they've had with delivery in Peru in the last four or five years, the, the separation of powers, uh, which is extreme between the presidency and the Congress has been really difficult. They've, and the Congress keep impeaching presidents and they keep falling. It's very hard in those kinds of political contexts to do, so, do things. So we, what we've done in Peru is work with a couple of agencies and with some local governments who are willing to get on and do this. So, but there's not, so you, you can still do something, but you can't do what you want to do with the government. So the constitution matters, and then the culture matters. So in a civil service, in, in Pakistan, for example, civil servants are very deferent to, to, to their boss and certainly to the political leader. And you have to find ways of getting, the, getting an honest conversation between the chief minister and his civil servants and his officials. So those, those three things you have to take into account. But I do, I, I mean, implied in your question, I do decide, we, we do sometimes, I decide that with that politician, there's no way we're gonna get anything done. And you know, that's, that, that does happen sometimes. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the final consideration is an ethical one, given what some governments do that are really unpleasant. Like we had a decision to make when, you'll remember the Khashoggi murder, in, um, and we had been engaged in uh, Saudi Arabia to do a relatively small thing, which I'll come to. I was invited to a big event, I refused to go, or I just pulled out. But the, the piece of work we were doing was reducing road deaths, which Saudi Arabia had very high road deaths. And we decided to do that because it, it didn't, there was no sort of credit to the government. It didn't involve work, it didn't involve working with the, the Crown Prince, but it but and it did work. And we reduced road deaths by 25, 30% in one year. So you just think well, that benefited the citizens and it didn't really. There's not, not massive credit for the government. So we decided to do that, but it's not an obvious answer. That's not necessarily right. That's a dilemma. So we debate those things. Mm -hmm. So um, again, I'll invite uh, people in the audience to post questions in the Q&A box. Uh, I wanna revisit an issue that we had talked about in one of our joint sessions between the Leadership Academy and the Delivery Institute, which has to do with how, um, how the operations of governments and institutions has been changing over time that, uh, you know, there's a lot of data that people simply don't trust governments 
They don't trust uh, big organizations, corporations, labor unions, the way they uh, used to. And therefore the ability of governments to actually accomplish the things that they promise their voters they're going to accomplish just become much more uh, difficult. Uh, and I think also people expect uh, you know, a higher degree of citizen participation from the grassroots. Uh, you know, the, the days when governments could simply decide, okay, this is the right thing and we're gonna do it and everybody would snap to attention. Those are, I mean, if that ever existed, it's certainly long gone. But I, I guess what I'm asking is, is that your experience in the course of your career that the challenges actually facing governments and the level of trust has been deteriorating and that in order to regain that trust and that ability to act that, that you know, people that want to deliver services really have to think differently. Yes, that has been my experience and it is a huge problem. Um, and you, you wrote a beautiful book in the 90s called Trust. And, um, but if you revisited that, I think a lot of what you just said would come out in, in, mm -hmm. in it would have to be a big revision of, of, of what you wrote because the world has changed dramatically in that time and I think it has it is harder that's what I said Americans were high trust people and I I don't yeah. think you could make that assertion exactly so <laughs> and but, but it was true at the time and the and the so I think that this um this does mean changing things and the it does mean changing the way you think about delivery and getting things done and I think you mentioned citizen engagement and participation. I think we have to find new means of doing that. I think some of the, I've seen some examples, mainly in local governments, of very good use of citizens' assemblies, for example. Uh, uh, I've seen, I think, I've done work for the UK Treasury, which they're still work, working on, but how you measure the value, the public value generated by particular pots of expenditure. And generally, in, the, in, the, in most of the last 50 years, the way we've thought about the value you get is we say, well, we're gonna spend this money and we're gonna have 20,000 new police officers or we're gonna have, uh, have class sizes of no more than 25 like they did in California in the 1990s. And that, so, so in, the, old, in the, the traditional way of thinking value in the public sector is to say inputs equal outputs, even though that clearly isn't true. Um, but that was the basic assumption. So. In, in the way I've been talking with the Treasury about public value, and I'm glad, glad to say they're taking this seriously, although it's hard to do. One, one measure of value is if you've got um, a budget of $300 million for three years, what are the outputs that you want to get from the end of that? What, 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 what change do you want to make in the world? Reduced in wait, waiting times in health or reduced crime or better test results in schools? Or whatever. So, so measuring the outcomes, which is what I did in the delivery unit for Blair. The second pillar is inputs. Are you managing the inputs properly? Are you spending the money for what it was meant to be spent on? Is there any corruption? Is, it, is there any waste? Is it getting to the people who are meant to benefit from it? Which is not obvious, but uh, some governments do it very well. The third pillar is relates to your question, which is, are you engaging not just the people who deliver the service, but the people who use the service? There's an awful lot of money being spent by governments around the world on mental health now. You can't solve mental health problems without the sufferer engaging with you. You just can't. And ideally the sufferer's family and friends. And so you, you've got to get into engagement to get value. And then beyond that, you want the taxpayer to think, actually, I do want to spend my money on that, even though I don't suffer from mental health problems. So that, that means that there's a whole job of dialogue. And these things that uh, I've seen it in the British government, all the government departments say, yeah, we can do the first two, we can get better than the third one. Sounds really difficult. It is difficult, but we have to do it. And mm -hmm. then the fourth, the fourth pillar is, um, is stewardship. While you do all those things, are you leaving your system better set up for the future? Are you leaving, if, you, if you're providing water for everybody across Pakistan, are you leaving the underlying water system set up for the long-term future as well as delivering these things in the short term. So I think this question of citizen participation is really important. It's about data, it's about, it's about transparency, it's about being honest when you're failing, it's about having a proper dialogue about what doesn't work, and it's about involving and engaging people mm -hmm. in the way you set your goals. And if you do all of that and then operate effectively and deliver and people see that that worked, that will generate trust, but that's a lot of ifs. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But of course, there's 
the possibility of a little bit too much participation because uh, a lot of times the people that participate are actually not representative of you know the broader population or they're activists or they have particular agendas and they use those participation But it's right, and lobby groups are clever and powerful and more connected. And that is that that you need citizen engagement goes far beyond that. Otherwise, that just generates a whole cynicism about they they've stitched it all up. Right. Well, let me turn to some questions that are coming in from the audience. Uh, the first one is, um, what is the biggest challenge you've ever set? What's the most significant moment of achievement? Uh, uh, and what did you totally fail at? Uh, and how do you bounce back? So both successes oh. and failures. When I look back on, um, so the, 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 these are things about me, so, but, but in, any, in any answer I give you, it wasn't just me, it was with a plot politician, it was with a team, it was lots of other people. I'm, the things I'm most proud of are the, um, the, the transformation of literacy in English primary schools, in elementary schools um, in the late 90s and early 2000s, the huge reductions in the, in the following few years in waiting times for routine operations, elective surgery in the Blair years, which was, I think, saved the NHS actually and made it a successful organization. And the, the doctors and nurses that I met at the time were quite critical of it and they felt a lot of pressure when I went back um, years later, like I had a, had an episode of cancer, and so I saw a lot of doctors and nurses, and they would say, you know, they they chat and they say, what did you, what you know, what do you do? And I would talk about that, and they they'd say, oh yeah, that was a golden era, and I said, you didn't say it was a golden era at the time. <laughs> golden era is always in the past, aren't they? And the but that that was big, and then and then outside of Britain, the most the thing I'm most proud of is is the transformation of schools and health care in Punjab, Pakistan. I, I went 54 times in a nine year period and it was, it went from the chief minister and me believing it could be done to hundreds of people actually doing it and then thousands of people and then the whole thing. It was very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and then, then how about things that didn't work? Yeah. Um, there's, there's, um, I worked. I, I won't name the country because I, I don't want to um, be critical of the country. Or the, but the but it was it was a, a, a relatively poor country in Africa with very rapidly growing population that wanted to improve its health and education system, and we struggled to find the people. We found some delightful, clever, interesting people, but they didn't have the traction out through the country and. They would write plans and they'd slightly reorganize things, but nothing ever really made a difference. And then finally, actually going back to what some of you said, Frank, we, we finally got a, a small pilot study going that really was working, but we've been at it for two years and the funder was saying this isn't really working and the, the government of the country said, oh, can we carry on now? But the, the, there was a lack. Of, and so and I, I'm self-critical. I didn't spend enough time on it. Uh, my team built lovely relationships with the relevant officials, but not, they weren't challenging enough. Um, and in the end, we just didn't have the, they didn't have the capacity in the bureaucracy and we didn't we didn't put enough capacity in to get them to do the job. And that was a complete failure actually. Mm -hmm. I was very, very disappointed with it. Um, so so there, there, are, there are clear lessons there. And then in, in, in Britain, um, we, had a, we had a goal to, it was a very difficult goal actually to return failed asylum seekers to their country of origin and it was it was almost impossible because you ended up with very difficult morally and ethically cases but also returning a lot of the countries you were supposed to be returning people to you couldn't under the human rights legislation mm -hmm. right from a moral point of view so that was just a, a nasty goal and then we had a, we had a transport goal that was completely crazy and we had to drop it and get rid of it and that was all very embarrassing but then we got back and did something else that did work yeah so well of course that wasn't exactly your fault uh i mean that was the european courts that made it uh you know so yeah. difficult but 
Yes, but but it, yeah, but it would always have been very difficult without the courts, but the European courts certainly didn't help. That's true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, there's a question. Uh, in countries like Tunisia, you uh, have a new government every six months. Sometimes the staff uh, in the delivery unit changes rapidly too. How do you maintain a reform program in situations like that? Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, and that the, we have to be honest, sometimes you can't. Um, you know, if you get if you get that much turmoil, it's very very difficult. Um, I did personally try to uh, going back to a country I mentioned before, keep a delivery agenda going at national level in Peru through three different presidents and prime ministers, um, and in the end, it just fell away, and we ended up working at local government or regional government level. Um, but you, well, I think you. With any with any delivery agenda in any in, in any circumstances, you need to you you might start with a very small group of people, a prime minister and a handful of others, or a minister and a handful of others, or, you know, three or four people. They can get started, but you have to consciously build support for the agenda as you implement. Build more people who understand why you're doing it, what how what 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 good looks like, yeah. what success is. So I call it ever widening circles of leadership, and in in somewhere like Tunisia, when you in those circumstances in the end you have to embed the the ambition and the delivery approach in the people who are actually doing the work so you you, you if you've got very unstable politics you almost have to find ways of embedding the delivery into the system but as i say you can't it's it's still that is very it's easy to say on a seminar now but it's very very difficult to do in practice but mm -hmm. you can sometimes deliver in spite of the government and then the politics sorts itself out and picks it up. And if you've got some evident success, even the most half-baked politician likes success. So if, you, if you've got some success and you can attach it to an incoming politician, sometimes that can, can get you through. But there are some mm -hmm. times when it's gonna fail, that's the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've seen that a lot in the, um, the post-Arab Spring states, including right. Russia, which is the most successful of them in many ways. Uh, so there's a question from Larry Diamond. How can your lessons inform climate change policy when the responses demand coordination among many governments and when all governments confront the challenge of people discounting the need for short-term sacrifice to get longer-term protection? We, you, you would, I mean, it, it is the biggest delivery challenge humanity's ever faced. So every, as I was saying earlier, every country has now got a net zero goal and a deadline but very few have got a proper plan or even necessarily the political will to make it happen if they had a plan. So it is a huge challenge. You would think potentially that having every country in the world with the same homework assignment might be an opportunity for them to learn systematically what works as people go about this implementation. So you, and you could group countries into by, by, the nature of the challenge like the, the oil rich countries it's a totally different challenge from the pacific islands or you know we, we go to a whole so you could group countries and, and build them into kind of learning sets and being a bit idealistic i know and try to learn the practice as you went um so you can imagine at least in theory setting up some systems to do that i've been talking to the british minister who chaired the cop 26 is a very very good guy called alok sharma um and they, they are looking at, and there are some um, NGOs already doing this, getting data systems that allow consistent benchmarking of types of countries. Um, but in the end, you are going to have to change, um, change the, the popular perspective of this. And that is about communication. And the best politicians can do that, um, but it's very difficult. And at the moment, as implied in the question, lots of people are not yet prepared to take the pain involved in the short and medium term to deliver a long-term goal. Um, Blair would call that leveling with people about the challenges ahead. I think Trudeau has tried to do that with the whole, uh, you know, get, getting, he's the only G7 politician that successfully introduced carbon pricing and then won an election following that, but he didn't win it easily. He won mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. and so this is very, very difficult, and we don't know how to do that. So, um, the, the, so at the same time as you rely on governments, you might want to rely on sectors. Can you get 
the people who make concrete over time to change what they do? Can you get the people who, you know, so, so you, you, you need to work with sectors, simple things like changing the accounting standards for businesses so that they have to account for their environmental impact or their net, net, net zero or lack of net zero impact. These things would make a difference. So mm-hmm. there's a whole set of things we have to do. We're in a better position after the COP26, but the question actually gets to the heart of the biggest single challenge humanity's ever faced, and we do have to take it on now. Right, and not every public policy problem is actually solvable. I think that's uh, <laughs> that's an unfortunate reality that uh, we sometimes don't confront. Uh, maybe I could ask you about how you do evaluation. You know, right now in academia, uh, doing randomized uh, controlled trials is all the rage as a method of evaluation because it's the most rigorous, you know, like uh, what they do with testing of pharmaceuticals. But they're also slow and they tend to be quite expensive. Uh, and you talked about the need to constantly update and evaluate. How do you, how do you approach uh, evaluation of whether what you're doing is, is working or not? It's, a, it's a, another very good question. I just want to comment on your previous observation about some public policy problems are insoluble. It's in, if you think about that over history, yes, they were insoluble, but somehow, humanity models through and finds a way of adapting and, mm-hmm. and you could argue I mean, so theoretically you could argue that, that that turns out to be the solution they're just going to let people model through i'm not, I'm not but and and so I, I actually accept your point that some things are not soluble by governments acting in a public policy way but there will be ways around or through or modeling through on on the, on the evaluation we do, we we. I always say to governments, you need first of all, you need the cl- as close to real time data as you implement. That's not for evaluative purposes. To, it's to know in real time is it working, and the more you can benchmark your different units in your system, different branches of local government, mm-hmm. and see which succeed and which aren't, uh, you can you can use that to learn. So that ability I emphasised before about you got to learn as you go to do ambitious things. So that's that's important. The second thing is I think you can set up evaluation teams that work for and with you you give them some independence and you get them to report to you every six months as you go the problem with traditional evaluation is you finish whatever it is and then you evaluate and then you learn you know a couple of years too late what you should have done three years ago as it were Mm -hmm. those kinds of evaluations are good if, if they're done well and they are important for future policy but they don't help you do your current policy so i think you need you need real time data you need um, not instant, but but rapid analysis and problem solving, and then applying it back in. Mm-hmm. And then you need really systematic evaluation after the event to understand what you did well, what you did wrong, and what the lessons are for future policy. So it's not one or the other; it's it's both. Um, I do think that I see a lot of evaluations done that are not that rigorous in what they do. Randomized control trials are very, uh, exactly as you say, but before you embark on a policy, you haven't often got time to do a three or four year randomized control trial. I quite like the nudge stuff that um, my colleague David Halpern uh, in the British government led, where you t- do very small experiments all the time and try and learn from them as you do that. So I think mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. that as well. So I think it's not one or the other, it's, it's combinations of these approaches. Right. So there's a question about how you get back on track in case your plan goes haywire. Uh, In the uh, case of the pandemic, daily routines were uh, uh, badly disrupted. Uh, How do we stick to a routine? I mean, you talked about the need for persistence. uh, And I guess the question might be, when do you decide you actually shouldn't persist or you should move to a different track altogether? You need the routines to to make that kind of decision. So you, you, you do need to persist with the routines, even if it's to, 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 to totally change track. And sometimes you do have to do that, particularly in the situation we were in in um, early and mid-2020 when everybody's facing something completely new and doesn't know what to do and you have to make it up as you go along. Um, but I do, I think the here, here some of the answer is making sure that around the decision maker there are diverse perspectives and you don't get groupthink 
So what, what um, the British journalist Matthew Said calls cognitive dissonance becomes very important. So can you know, the, the, the classic in American history in that beautiful Doris Kearns Goodwin book team of rivals about Abraham Lincoln building a cabinet that you know will disagree sometimes is important as long as you can get that disagreement and the sense of loyalty at the same time. Um, and I think leaders really need to go out of their way to make sure that you do get challenge. Uh, and that, that was, to be honest, that, that's the main thing I did in Punjab, Pakistan, because the, the, there's a sense of deference to a very strong chief minister. I could say what I thought, because the worst that could happen to me is they'd say, don't come anymore. Um, so so you, you do need to set up cognitive dissonance. And I think that's important that the military in America and, and Britain actually use the red team concept of a, a, a team set up explicitly to challenge all the way through. And if you do that well, that can really help. Mm -hmm. and that's, mm -hmm. then, then you'll know when you either when you when you've screwed up so badly or when circumstances have changed in ways you didn't anticipate, you need to change direction and you can pivot. Mm -hmm. rather than pivoting because it's just too, it seems too difficult which is not what you want to do right uh so we have a question um in a country if the political cycles are short and uh there's little policy continuity uh executing the kind of systematic uh planning that you were talking about uh doesn't seem you know very possible uh, there's an alternative, which is to accumulate expertise, data, and plans outside of the government uh, and wait for an opportunity when you could actually bring it into um, uh, uh, existence. And so the question, I suppose, you know, is that a viable alternative? And if that is, uh, how should a society set itself up so that it's ready to, you know, execute these ambitious plans you know when the when the time is right is that something that can be done outside of government i do think i well I, I don't think there are alternatives but i do think and i think the us actually is very strong in this you have you know big foundations and um uh, great universities doing some of that thinking and um and if you, if you think of what um, Bloomberg has done on climate change, for example, with American cities, we, we've we've worked with the Bloomberg Foundation on, you know, 25 big American cities, including San Francisco, on the, the climate change agenda, and they've done really well. We, 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 and Bloomberg's brought together the climate change agenda, real real uh, um, climate change experts with delivery experts ourselves, and then we've worked with mayors in those cities, and you can see they they. If, if, if America was just those 25 big cities like Atlanta and San Francisco and Columbus and so on, you'd be meeting the Paris Climate Change Accords goals and exceeding them, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and so that people like Bloomberg and Gates and some of the big, um, the, the big universities working in collaboration with them have done some fantastic work. And I think it is good to have people outside of government prepared for when you get the right moment uh, to do things. But even when the right moment comes, you don't know that the right moment will last. And so you're still faced with the same problem that, uh, of, of, of before of how you get continuity through the electoral cycle. And that is a, that is a, a huge challenge. And there's no guarantees because that's the nature of democracy. But if you, if you can get real momentum early in a term and get some early results, build enough support um, either so that you've got a better chance of winning the next election. Also, the opposition say, well, we'll be critical, but not of that, because that's obviously working. Then you've got a chance of getting through. Uh, but there are there are no guarantees. And I, so I do think it's good for people outside the government to develop uh, proposals and work them through and have them set up and uh, advocate them and uh, make the connections into government and find the people who can do them. But that's no more guaranteed than the alternatives. And in the end, you've got to find a way of getting through the political cycle. Right. Okay, so we're uh, really close to the end of our time. I want to sneak in one more personal question. Uh, so how did you apply your own framework to biking across the UK? <laughs> because you said that this is something that can apply to, you know, you yeah. setting personal goals. Yeah, so I, I, I when I was, I was 60 a few years ago, and I decided to do something 
I'm sure when I was 50, I, I went walking in the Himalayas. And when I was 60, I decided to cycle not the, for, from Fort William on the west coast of Scotland to my home in Devon, keeping as far west as possible, so uh, near the coast and through the mountains. Um, now, that's a, that, that was like a three-week cycle ride for me. Um, so somebody younger could have done it faster. But, but I then begin to think, well, how will I do that? I need, I need a team. What, what happens if I get a puncture? I'm hope, or if my bike breaks down I, and I'm on my own, I'm not going to be able to do it. So I need a team. So I have to build a team. So I've set the goal, the, the ambitious goal. I need a team. I need a decent bike. I need to be able to repair the bike on the road. I need a map. I need, uh, I'm busy because I'm working all the time. So I need somebody to book the place I'm going to stay. You, know, you, you end up building a team around you to do this work. I need, it, when, when we got a team and there's a there's a, a small van a truck following me um i then need to make sure i've got all the kit in case i can you know have to repair them so i talk to my local bike shop they'll lend me the kit uh and i'm going to do a blog every day but i'm not going to be in a position to do it so i'm going to email it to my daughter and she's going to publish it this is what i mean so you, you end up just mapping out and then you don't want to cycle on the busy roads. You want to cycle on the beautiful back roads. And so you have to spend hours on the floor with maps, mapping your route. So you end up applying deliverology, set the goal, build your team, uh, do the mapping, uh, and then solve problems as they arise and do your routine, one daily blog. So it's it's very similar, actually. Um, Good. Well, it's very inspiring. Um, yeah, so I'll yeah, have to see the goals you set when you're 70 and then 80 and 90. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, 70 is coming up in about, uh, well, four years. I've just been 66. So I'll, I def I'll definitely, I'll let you know. And, uh, and right. Somebody at Stanford can join me for whatever the trip is. Okay, very good. Well, Sir Michael, thank you very much. That was a fascinating discussion. Uh, thank you, everyone in the audience for uh, attending. And um, uh, buy the book, um, uh, Accomplishment, and see what you can accomplish. So, so long, everybody, and uh, we'll see you for the next uh, CDDR seminar. Thank you, Frank, and thanks to Stanford and the team. Bye-bye.